feel like I'm going to have a heart attack. And that's all because my boss has come. That's a maladaptive evolutionary response because adrenaline was not the useful thing to do. I have no power over that. Or do I? As I've already said, uh, adrenaline and uh, oxygen are produced together. The body, but the body breathes very quickly, does that automatically, it produces adrenaline. And they're combined um, responses. If we can interfere with the breathing response, we will also interfere with the production of adrenaline. And that's what we want to do when our clients come to us and say, I'm having panic attacks. I'm getting incredibly anxious. We need a bit of first aid to close that down. And the way that we close that down is introduce techniques like uh, We uh, talk about 7-11 breathing in England. Uh, it's breathing in through the mouth for the count of seven. You're probably familiar with this. Breathing out through the nose for the count of 11. The whole point being, if you're breathing out, you can't be bringing in more oxygen. You can adapt that to suit your clients. If they've got uh, lung problems, they might not be able to breathe, breathe in and out for that period of time. Um, so that, that's a useful technique. Of course, your client's already found a recovery system for these panic attacks. It's called having a drink. And uh, that's, that's exactly what I would have done. If that's the reason why I might have my first drink at, say, 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, because what happened as far as my head was concerned was a little thought came up that said, have a drink right now. And I listened to my little thought, and that's what I used to do. I'd have one drink right now. One drink will fix me. So where did that little thought come from? If we imagine what we've just talked about happens at a subconscious level, any strong emotion that comes along, be it my boss coming to the door, or me remembering what my wife said to me yesterday, or me fearing about, oh, I've got a school exam in, in seven days' time and things, all of those things generate emotions that we feel in the here and now. The fact that I'm thinking of a future event doesn't mean to say the emotion is going to be in the future. It is very much going to be felt in the here and now. And there's quite clear psychological reasons as to why that might be. The areas of the brain that process that kind of thing, if you like, have no concept of future or past. They very much, it's all to do with here and now. Um, I've got a little app on my phone. If you're interested, I can show you some of those areas later on. But it means if I fear about the future, I'm going to have a strong emotion right now. That's possibly I'm not aware of it. It's in my unconscious. But my brain is aware of it. And it says, oh, last time we had one of these, we found when we had a drink, that made it better. So it sends a little thought up to the conscious part of the brain that says at 11 o'clock in the morning, oh, Simon, have a drink. Oh, that seems like a good idea. I'll have a drink. Now, if I could only have one drink, what would be my problem? Okay, so it might be a bit unusual to have a drink at 11 o'clock in the morning, but if I had one drink at 11 o'clock in the morning and stopped, I wouldn't be an alcoholic. You know? And it tells us in the doctor's opinion that, uh, that uh, even all those years ago, Dr. Silks has observed that there was uh, um, a physical and a mental aspect to this illness. And the physical aspect, I'm going to argue, is to do with the production of a dopamine. We've known for a long time that dopamine is a main feature of the limbic uh, reward system in the brain. What is more recent, or as far as I know, is more recent, you may be able to challenge that so or so, so I've had evidence before that. There's a professor in England called Totes. Uh, he was working with an American colleague who I can't remember. They produced a very interesting paper. And they have argued that dopamine is produced in anticipation of doing something. So it is not only a reward system, it is a motivating system. Their argument goes along the lines of, again, going back to hunter-gatherer things and setting it in an evolutionary setting, that 
hunter-gatherers, human beings, need to be motivated to do certain things. Some human beings, whatever percentage that is, I think it's, it's argued to be roughly around 10, could be more or less, uh, in hunter-gatherer societies will be prepared to take higher risks to get high-value food. Food is scarce in those conditions. You increase your reproduction chances if you personally can get hold of higher food and your compatriots can't. Your genes will go forward. The higher value food that you will find in hunter-gatherer times is honey. Wild honey, for example. Uh, it will be high up in the trees. You will need to take risks to get it. 90% of the hunter-gatherers will look up there and say, that is a wild honey hive. It's surrounded by angry bees and it's high in the trees. I am not going to take the risks to do it. 10%, and this is where the motivation system of dopamine comes in, will look up at that and they will be motivated. Dopamine will already start flowing through the brain, through the reward system, and particularly to the front of the brain. When dopamine hits some of the areas in the front of the brain, it turns off our inhibition systems. So what looked like to be very risky starts looking a lot less risky. Climbing that very high tree. The closer you get to the beehive, the more motivation you're getting, the more dopamine is flowing into the brain, the bigger reward. But you know what? Those bees that are stinging you, well, you push past those because you're getting more and more dopamine. And I'll argue that it's dopamine that we're all addicted to, in, in, you know, but, or many people are addicted to, I shouldn't speak for other people. Um, so we're pushing forward onto that beehive. And then we're stuffing our hands in because we're men. I'm talking about men. If you were a woman, you'd realise you'd get a stick and you put that in the beehive and eat the honey and you don't get stung. But men would stick their hands in and eat all that lovely honey, all thousands of calories of high value food, uh, all the time getting a dopamine reward. And the more honey they got, the more reward they get. They take on thousands of calories until the honey was gone. And then the dopamine system starts to slow down, they begin to realise I'm very high up in a tree, I'm getting stung by some very angry bees, I think I'll leave this situation now. And providing they successfully got up and down the tree, then they had a huge advantage over 90% of the rest of their fellows, because they've taken in thousands of calories. That's a perfect piece of evolution. Lovely. Until you come into the 21st century and uh, you find that alcohol is, you go into your supermarket, oh, I should say that what prevents them from becoming addicts is it's going to be another two weeks before you see a wild beehive. You know, it's kind of, that's the difference. If you go into your supermarket, once you've finished your first bottle of whiskey, you can go back and get another one, and you can go back and get another one. So it's maladaptive, it's become maladaptive because we've, got a, we've built up society since then. We have a surplus of foods, we have a surplus of alcohol and things like that. When we come to look at addictions, uh, here's another argument I'm going to put forward to you. And you may have come across this in the work that you've done. Um, I think man's earliest addiction would have been to sex. And when I say man, I mean humankind, I think, and possibly even men particularly, I think their earliest addiction would have been to sex, because that too has a motivation and a reward to it, which is carried by dopamine. I think the second addiction that you're going to really come across are to those high-value sugary foods. And in the West, we certainly have a mammoth problem, it may not really be identified yet, of people who are addicted to sugars, super refined sugars. Uh, if you look, watch any piece of newsreel, that was a bit dated, any piece of television from the United States uh, and increasingly from Britain and Europe, you will see many obese people. Um, I'm, I, would, I would argue that many of them are not greedy. What it is, is they're addicted to sugar. Um, exactly that process that we talked about with the wild beehive is happening there. That they, they, they have one piece of chocolate. I'm like this. If I have one piece of chocolate, one square of chocolate, 
I've got to have the next one, the next one, and the next one. And that's very similar. I think alcohol tricks that reward system somehow. Perhaps it tricks it, perhaps it gives a genuine reward because it lowered my anxiety. But once I had one drink, I had to have another, and another, and another. Now I know that sounds quite complex, what I've gone to. I've tried to sort of put into a very small pot the idea of a physical addiction and a mental addiction. The mental bit being, I will solve my anxiety by suppressing my emotion with my first drop of alcohol. The physical bit being, once I've had my first bit of alcohol, I will want another and another and another because the dopamine reward system is doing that to me. And I will not stop until I fall over. I certainly won't stop because I run out of whiskey, because it's highly unlikely I'm going to run out of whiskey. When I was younger and didn't have a lot of money, that might have stopped me. But when I became older and was slightly more affluent, or I'd learnt about more sources of alcohol and things, I could easily overcome the idea of running out of alcohol, but I could never get over the fact that eventually I would fall over, and that would be when I stopped. And to me, that's an alcoholic. So that, that's somebody who's addicted. Um, that you need both of those dynamics going on. It will manifest that our clients are incredibly sensitive. Once they spend some time away from alcohol, that will come through. When I was talking about doing those surveys, the Bex Depression Inventory, I went doing the Anxiety Inventory. Once they've had maybe two or three weeks away from alcohol, then those anxieties and depressions will start to emerge and be visible. So that's my notion, that's my model of our alcohol that sort of, when I'm working with a client, that's what's going on for them. And that can be drugs as well that do that suppressing and fire up the dopamine system. Uh, you know, we have all kinds of addicts, uh, I'm an addict too. What works for me might not work for somebody else in terms of my self-medication. I've spoken a lot there, and I've perhaps not said it very well, so I think that I'd like to open up the floor if you'd like to ask some clarification on points or make some observations. Does anyone have any questions at this point? Mm. I had a question, but I think you just answered it. Yeah. The question was that uh, you mentioned about all these inventories that we can... Oh, all right, on. yeah. So, um, say if you're doing a study on something, depression, anxiety, yeah. and we have a sample of um, alcoholics and we need to administer this inventory to them. Yeah. How do we know when to administer it? I think you've got to, and again this is where your counselling and therapeutic skills come in, that uh, in everyday language we talk about, as counsellors, we talk about when people are becoming receptive and when they're identifying and talking about their feelings. Once that starts to emerge, that's the sort of time that you would start administering that kind of, of a survey. It's a short questionnaire, if I remember correctly, it has about 20 questions on it, with five possible outcomes. Um, it in itself doesn't diagnose anxiety or depression, depending on what it used. You have to use a lot of your own skills and understand that, uh, for example, if you administer it too early for immediately after someone's done a detox, for example, and say it's the anxiety one, you'll find that anxiety is impossibly low. You know, you'll look at it, and once you've got some experience of, of doing these, you'll think, oh, that's, that, that doesn't look right. Zero. How can you have zero anxiety? Everybody has some anxiety. What that's actually telling you is that that person is really suppressing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the scores themselves don't automatically give an answer. This is where our therapy skills and our prior, our sort of um, taught knowledge over and above what a lay person might have comes into being. Understanding what's going on. That if I administer these tests at different times, I will get different results. Why am I getting different results? Because early on, they're still emotionally repressed. If you've been working well as a counsellor for emotional oppression, they should feel safe enough to allow those emotions to start coming up and bubbling up to the surface. 
and therefore if you administer the test then, then you will get a very high emotional response. So you can still say that approximately two or three weeks post detox? Um, yeah, that, that would be. Everybody's different. Yeah. And that's <laughs> really the way you get a feel for these things, you start administering them. Mm -hmm. uh, don't take any serious, don't try and put them forward for any serious research or anything. Mm -hmm. Just, um, you start administering them, you've learned with your clients what you, what's going on, and then start trying to make sense of, okay, so client A, I administered this straight away after they've done their detox and I got zero. Then three weeks later, and I've been working with them very well, they're suddenly very emotional. And then six months later, it's dropped. So you can start understanding, you know, at the beginning, it was because it's very repressed. A few weeks later, it's because they're actually acknowledging their emotions, and then hopefully later on, when it's dropped again, that's because of the work you've done with them and the work they've done. So play with them. You know, you, they're easy to find on the internet. We tend to use, or I tend to use, Rosenberg self-esteem, mm -hmm. which, after a matter of politeness, they do ask you to write to uh, the Rosenberg Institute. It's free of charge, but they like to know why you're using it and, 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 and to ask permission. And the same again for the VEX. You'll find they're all on the internet, uh, they're, they're readily available. I do write to these people and say, you know, as part of my therapeutic work, I've chosen to use your scale, uh, and I hope this is all right. Usually you never hear back, but Rosenbergs are quite good at writing that. They, they do thank you. And uh, they do ask if you do any research with it, that you let them know about it, so they can help validate their scale in return. Uh, so, uh, you know, these things are out there. Um, I think I choose Bex and Rosenberg because lots of research refers to those. Yes. In the NHS, in, in the National Health Service in England, they have different scales uh, which they use uh, for a medical reason. Uh, they tend to be much simpler and quicker to organise and things, but they're not particularly used in research. Like bands. They, they have, there's various, cage is a very yes. fast way of identifying. Well, yeah, it's, it's only got about four questions <clears> in, to be honest. It's there for sort of a uh, uh, community nurse to say, do you do this, do you do this, do you do this, do you do this, you should go and see. It's a very good screening tool, actually. Yeah, it's, a, it's a screening tool, really. Uh, but the Vex and the Rosenberg are uh, more academic tools, and they're very useful. They do give you a, a useful thing. If you look on our website, Addictions UK, we have um, a, a comprehensive test about uh, screening for personality disorder, schizoid, things like that. Now, it doesn't give you any results. Those results actually come through to us. But I'm sure that's something, if that was a tool that you were interested in using. Very useful for looking for dual diagnosis. Um, that if after six months of working with somebody, uh, they will always come back with high uh, schizoid, uh, not schizoid, uh, schizotypal or um, paranoid, they will always come back early on being quite high. If they're not reducing, then you're looking at dual diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But I, I disagree with people who say you can, dual di you can make a diagnosis of dual diagnosis before you've removed the alcohol, because I don't think you can. If you give those, those uh, test sheets to people who are drinking, again, they're going to be all over the place. How much have they had to drink? If they've had a lot, the scores might be low. If they haven't had a drink yet, they'll be way up here somewhere. Um, you know, their antisocial tendencies, um, well, that again depends on how much they've drunk. You need a steady kind of, you need to get everything calmed down before you can administer those tests. But they're very useful. If not, you're not using them for research, they're very useful to begin to get an understanding of what's going on for your own learning. Um, <clears throat> work with them, do the test, you can quantify what's going on. And the test is solid, it doesn't vary. <coughs> As a counsellor, I might be feeling more sensitive one day than I am the next. So, you know, we've got two variances there. The test stays solid, so you've only got one variance, mm -hmm. which is the client. What about the model I, I, I propose for understanding? Did you find that useful? Does the evolutionary think, idea make sense? No, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Because from the medical background they come from. Mm -hmm. Even here we try to educate people about this aspect. Mm -hmm. That's one aspect. Even families when they come in. Mm -hmm. 
You can also adapt that, by the way. You don't have to use. In, in Britain, and more so in America, there is overwhelmingly most people will understand or have some idea of a scientific and be open-minded to a scientific idea. However, there is a significant group of people in, in, in Western society who will adhere to the biblical understanding of creation. The world is only some 5,000 years old and God created everything. You can change the language of that evolutionary process to fit in with their beliefs. Remember, as therapists, we're not researchers. We're not trying to establish a truth. We are trying to adapt to our clients, take the knowledge and theories that we've developed and understood and present those to our clients in a way that they understand and that they can say, yes, I can see how that might be. And you know when you got it right is when they start to feed that back plus more to you. Now what they're feeding back might not be what you agree with, it might not fit in with your personal model, if it's creating a model of understanding of how the world works for them, then that is good enough. And that leads us into that area of spirituality. How are we doing for time, Ralph? Yeah, I think uh, we can close. Right. A couple okay. of more questions. Yeah, certainly. So, one thing is that we work a lot over here with the biopsychosocial model. Yeah. And the reason we do that is because it uh, it divides our therapy into components which are easy to explain to the client, yeah. to the family, and it sort of helps us look at things in a more holistic perspective. Mm -hmm. So, if you could address tomorrow how your model fits in with this or doesn't fit in with this. Or how I'll, I'll, I'll try and see if we can work something into that. I mean, yes, we, uh, I mean, everything I, that I talk about should fit into that yes. biosocial model. I'm particularly interested in the individual understanding, the psychology, mm -hmm. uh, the social aspect, which can include things like housing or can include things like education or simply feeling safe and things. Um, there are other people in our organisation who may deal with that. Mm -hmm. And for the medical side, so a bit like yourself, for the medical side, which is primarily is the detox side and things, um, we, we have people, we have banks of doctors and things who, who will administer detoxes. I, I have an overview of those things, but um, obviously I defer to it. I have an idea what a doctor's doing when he's doing his detox. But obviously, uh, I'm a psychologist, I don't prescribe medications, that's the role for a doctor to do. And exactly which medications and how much is within the expertise of the doctor. Equally, how someone goes about finding secure housing and things is, is relevant um, to other parts of our organisation. And maybe not relevant to all our clients. Some of our clients are the rich and wealthy too, but they don't need help with housing unless they're getting kicked out, of course, you know, their possessions are being put into two black men bags and said, off you go, we've had enough of you, and then they might. But obviously some of the more charitable work we do is um, a revolve around providing housing and things as well. Well, thank you very much. Are, are there any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. If you can address tomorrow how to work more with atheists. With atheists? Well, yeah, yeah. Now, hopefully, that's where I, I got to and left off. That um, that I want to be able to talk about a scientific understanding of uh, spirituality, and we'll be covering such things as Maslow's hierarchy of need and how that's relevant. How you know what? It's not what you believe in that's important. It's the fact you believe. And I'll leave you with this thought: many alcoholics even if they're not aware of it, are incredibly depressed. And depression to me means I've lost all belief in everything. How many of our clients come to us with no belief whatsoever? And part of our role as therapists is to reawaken a belief in self. Here what I also notice is for most of the clients here, the family becomes the biggest enabling system and support system. In terms of allowing their alcoholism and drug addiction? To continue and uh, yes. for them to believe on their family. Absolutely, and that's absolutely the same in the UK. Um, we will often get, as an example of that, 
Um, initially our contact is over the phone. We will get uh, a mother ringing up and saying, well, uh, he does need some help, but I've taken control of the situation. I go and buy his heroin and divide it up and give it to him some each day. So I'm saying to her, so let me get this straight. You've now become a heroin dealer. Because as far as the law is concerned in the UK, she is supplying a controlled substance. So you know what? When we talk about addiction being a family illness, and unmanageability running throughout the family, and this reflects exactly what you've just said. You know, it, it runs throughout the family. Mum's now become a heroin dealer. Son number two, three, and four are all getting ignored because all the attention goes on son number one who's got the addiction, or, or husband number one who's got the addiction. The whole house walks around on eggshells, that's an expression we use, because no one dare say anything. For God's sake, make sure he gets his drugs, because he'll be unbearable if he doesn't. And in some ways, you can't blame families for enabling, because they have no other, no other avenue. You know? um, and, you know, and some of the biggest things we hear is, I, I say to mothers, often say to mothers, you've got to say to him, he's got to go out of the house. Get the police, he's got to go out of the house, otherwise he's going to have nothing left. Everything's going to be stolen you know, and sold for drugs. Oh, I can't put my son on the street. He's my son. You don't understand how it's like to have a son. And I'm trying to say to them, if you don't do that, you won't have a son. I can't guarantee you will have a son if you put him out on the street, but at least there's a chance he will reach that rock bottom. Mm -hmm. At least there's a chance. As long as you're enabling, why change? If someone made my addiction so easy, I could just continue it regardless. Why would I have one thought I want to change? Um, and in fact, my lifestyle almost did allow that to happen. It was only that sheer desperation and depression. And depression is a hard, not a good enough word to describe that state that you get into. And that's, you know, that's what I lacked, a total belief in anything, including myself. Uh, and that's what how many clients present. Um, uh, you know, mums and dads are great people saying they can fix everything. And they can't, because they too are powerless. Thank you.